Hi, and welcome to the Brookdale Visiting Writer Series show. My name is Suzanne Parker. I'm an associate professor here in the English department where I direct our creative writing program. I am so excited to have on the show today Ruth Sanabria. She is the author of two collections of poetry. Um, the first one, The Strange House Testifies, and most recently, Beasts Behave in Foreign Land. Her work has been translated and published internationally, and she teaches and lives in New Jersey. So, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you, We're Brookdale, th and thank you for having me. Thrilled to have you here. Reading through your two collections, um, and also kind of reading about you online as well, too, because that's what everyone does, is kind of stalk everybody to of get all course, their facts. Yeah. Um, your family story seems to have been you know, a large influence on your work and what you write about. So I thought maybe, yeah. could you start by telling us a little bit about your family story? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, you know, I was born in Argentina during a military dictatorship, and my parents were activists. They mm -hmm. were, my mother was um, rather young. She was like 19 when she had me, and she was in college. And my dad was also in college, but he was working as well. Mm -hmm. And um, they were part of a revolutionary movement mm -hmm. to to kind of democratize and establish rights um, for all people, not just like the wealthy, and um, to return Argentina to Argentinians. And, and just, I mean, I can't do it justice right now, like in a few seconds, like what the whole breadth of this revolutionary movement mm -hmm. in the Americas, because it wasn't just Argentina, you have to understand, it was also Brazil and Chile and Paraguay, Uruguay. It was like the whole South America. and. Mm -hmm. Maybe even further, but like definitely South America was in this space of resistance in the late 70s. And my parents were part of this movement. Mm -hmm. um, and in the late 70s, when uh, the dictatorship clamped down, my parents were both disappeared. My mother was kidnapped. Mm -hmm. I was kidnapped at the same time. Like I was 18 months old. Mm -hmm. And um, she was taken by military um, officers. So they broke down our house. They sealed off the block. There were helicopters. There were tanks, trucks, the whole thing. All from your parents? From a mother. From your mother. So these operations where they disappeared people were very visible, right? They weren't like mm. secret. They make it disappeared makes it seem like someone in the middle of the night comes and like kidnaps yeah. you. But it was actually an operation in which they ordered everybody to shut their blinds, close their doors, get inside. There were helicopters, trucks, and there were like like a dozen or so military officers armed and loud. So it's not like no one knew. It's just everybody was terrified. Mm -hmm. And um, witnesses were very afraid to come forward, but they did, you know? Mm -hmm. But it was it was at their own risk. And I was, um, and so what, where was I going with that? So my mother was disappeared um, and my grandmother found me. I was with neighbors, and there's I could go on and on with that, but um, basically I was I was fortunate to be found by my grandmother, and mm -hmm. so my grandmother raised me f while my mother was <laughs> and my dad were disappeared in a concentration camp, and later on as political prisoners, they were they were detained in um, prison for several years, and so all that to say that poetry for me begins back then because in this yeah. kind of climate of censorship where fear you know you're not allowed to speak or say or or testify and you're acquiring language as a toddler um you know, toddlers are really emotional creatures. Mm -hmm. And so like, that's the whole point of that, of the language acquisition. It's what you want, what you need, what you feel. And if that's, if you need your mother's body, if you need your, you know, you need clarification, you want food, home, love, and all that is kind of dangerous, how do you acquire language? Mm -hmm. And my grandmother is a painter. And so I uh, learned through her the value, like the power of symbol mm -hmm. and metaphor, because when I would ask, where is my mother? She would like point to um, kind of like a, like a cardinal mm -hmm. that would, you know, I started to learn like message, like to, to, to find symbols in nature as 
to where my mother could be um, mm -hmm. and to kind of listen to the sounds of and like kind of the the natural symbols and try to connect almost psychically with what is going on with people because we were not allowed to really speak. And so this very kind of, I think that's where poetry kind of emerges for me because my grandmother, she would document the things I would write. She was like, oh, these, these are little poems that you wrote. And I'm, and I'm looking at these and I'm like, these, this is like me trying to say something I'm um, trying to express yeah. the unexpressible at like, four, you know, 18 months, two years old, three years old. And um, yeah, it sounds really poetic, It's but it's because I, it was too dangerous to give me the language, right, of what was really going on. Uh -huh. So I had to express this kind of fear and terror and, and inquiry through questions about nature mm -hmm. and loss. And it sounds so profound, but it really, I don't think... Like, I don't think it's as profound as my grandmother wants it to be, but it was really the moment, I think, of where poetry becomes a form of of expression, like, or symbol and metaphor becomes so um, much about survival for me mm -hmm. and about sanity um, and, and being able to say what is I can't, I have no language for. Yeah. And so that that's where I think... Um, poetry emerges as part of like so deeply tied to that moment in, in my personal yeah. existence you know and but I didn't um think to write about it until much later on in my life um yeah, yeah it was a story that I really much I, like I really repressed because for obvious reasons yeah. it was very traumatic and um but yeah and then your family eventually emigrated to the states yeah we were um we were <laughs> There is this picture of us. I should have brought it. There is this picture of us. We were one of the, you know, Europe opened its doors to refugees from Latin America for mm -hmm. pol political prisoners um, and exiles. And the United States did not open their doors like like Europe did. Like Europe accepted, like Spain accepted mm -hmm. like hundreds and France and Sweden. But they accept the United States accepted a few and we were like the one of the few families that were reunited intact because a lot of the oh. families were of the disappeared did not survive so it might mm -hmm. be like just one person of the family yeah. survives yeah. um and everybody else has disappeared so there was a lot of like publicity or press when we got off that plane when my mom and I got off oh. that plane because we were um just like there was an angle, right? Like families reunited in the United States. Yeah. But yeah, we were political refugees. That's how we came in here. I have a parolee status. That's how I came in as a... Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha, wow. <laughs> wow. But then you did not write about this for a long time, you yeah. said. What, yeah. what finally gave you permission? Or what changed that you wanted to? You know, it's... it's I, I don't know. Like, I feel like growing up in Washington, D.C., a lot of what I, I connected to growing up like working class in a very urban uh, environment, um, I was really, I, I saw a lot of parallels. I mean, I had mm -hmm. a lot of friends whose parents were had been in prison. I saw a lot of police brutality. I mm -hmm. saw a lot, I mean, a lot of these, it was just like a new expression of the same experience I'd had. So I was very concerned with writing about uh, racism and police brutality and violence. And I understood it like very, you know, on a very real level. Mm -hmm. um, and and so I wrote about that. I think that that's what concerned me as an activist that like informed me. And I didn't mm -hmm. realize that I had this other kind of um, experience also. I, I kind of repressed it. Um, mm -hmm. And then I had like a cathartic moment um, around Around um, sub, like September 11th, when I was I was starting in uh, my grad school at NYU at that time, and it wasn't so much it was very much like seen like soldiers in like mm -hmm. full army you know gear. I remember the, that first started happening. It was weird. Yeah, and then the kind of this real violent rhetoric and this lexicon of terrorism and this kind of double speak and this kind of mind game just sent me right back to Argentina and this mm -hmm. it was just a lot of 
um, trying to stay sane with all this kind of um, disappearing of people, like mm -hmm. people being taken off, you know, kidnapped on on their way to work in Metro Park, New Jersey. Like, what is this? Mm -hmm. Like, really, you know, ending up in concentration camps and they're innocent people, you know what I mean? And yeah. that kind of thing really was uh, triggering in and, and, and a way that forced me to really understand who I was as a writer and why, you know, not why, but like how deep this all went for me and to find my voice in all this mm -hmm. as opposed to, so yeah, so that's, that's where I think that, not that it gave me permission, but that was the space in which I started to, I also, it was a great luxury to be in a graduate program and just yeah. to have like college loans to, <laughs> to write. <laughs> Um, f without having to work, yeah. like, you know, two or three jobs. You know, that was yeah. a luxury I gave myself for, like, a year or two before having to go back to the grind. I just wanted to ask you one last question before yeah. we take a break, which is your grandmother is, is an accomplished artist, and you're talking about kind of visual medium. So why, why writing instead of art? Well, I do. You, do I'm a, yeah, I'm also a visual artist, but I don't, I keep that really to myself. But I love, mm -hmm. I am, I, I do a lot of collage, and I also, I'm, I'm very much a visual artist, and I, I, I alternate. Like, my grandmother does the opposite. Like, she'll, she does visual art as her primary, like, mm -hmm. form of artistic expression. But when she needs a, a break or when she is um, kind of, in that space, like that gestational space before uh -huh. you produce something, she writes. And I feel I oh, do okay. this the opposite, like when I need to kind of back up, like I don't, I don't just not do anything, but I, I create in other ways. I, I have mm -hmm. to continue. So, um, yeah. Do you ever combine text and in the collages? Text yes, and the visual? Yes, yes. But, and I also think too that I tend to see in my poetry, tends to be really layered with like um, visual, like a visual collage, like I always mm -hmm. see painting, like I'm always seeing the painting that I wish I could, <laughs> but I can't. So um, a lot in this uh, Beast Behave in Foreign Land, I, I really do speak to my grandmother's paintings quite a bit, yeah. like there's a there's, conversation with yeah. them. I wondered if maybe you'd share a poem from sure, the book. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna share <laughs> Tatuaje. Uh, tatuaje means uh, tattoo in Spanish. And when I first shared this poem with my dad, he was like, you just can't call it ta ta tattoo. And I was like, why? And he was like, tattoo is a word, I don't know. In his, in his mind, tat tattoo is a word that didn't belong here. So uh -huh. I wrote tatuaje. tatuaje. A spirit came down and whispered in our drunk ears, Mark your rooms with wild roses. And between beers, I dreamed that we were soldiers missing our mothers, which explains why we are 17 and in a tattoo parlor that smells of ships and motorcycles, of leather and ocean, of marijuana and sad men's blood. We each ask for a single rose with a ribbon around the stem, for a word, some power. We want to be fire. The artist changes channels. We watch Looney Tunes as his needles start. When we stop at the liquor store, our roses, orange and violet, bleeding through the bandages. I want to tell you that if we ever find ourselves blindfolded in a war or in an apple metaphor accused of ruining it for everybody with hunger or knowledge, I would not insist on how sacred is the tree or the light or how sacred is what moves us. I'd become a storyteller and out of our inevitable estrangement, I'd make us up again and again. Hmm. Gorgeous. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, I also like, I love that the poem, it, it speaks to so many of the themes in the collection. Um, you know, kind of immigration, having to flee, um, the weight of memory and history, and even potentially the burden of that on these, on these young kids who just want to smoke and get tattoos. <laughs> um, and and it kind of, it's an ars poetica. I will be a storyteller. Um, and I guess it, part of me wonders, um, 
why why poetry then? I know you kind of spoke to that in the beginning, but you've got a heck of a memoir in in your life story as well too. Thank um, you. Yeah, I well I I um I've written essays and I am I think originally I think I am a short story writer. I am an huh. I think I am a novelist by nature. Like so I have written and written and written and written characters and stories oh, and okay. novels, but I don't put them out there. For me that is like and, and that's why not? I, you know, I don't know. I think that has to change. Like, it's calling me. Like, it's waking me up at mm -hmm. night. Like, it's one of those things where it's, like, burdening me now. Like, if you don't release this, it, yeah. you're going to explode. Like, it's going to come out one way or another. So what's happening is my poems are becoming these really long, you know, 10-page oh. narratives. And then, like, I am thinking of, like, the next. Like, it's just, it's got to happen. Mm -hmm. But originally I started by writing... Um, Characters and their their stories, like their stories. So uh -huh. there was very long, like I, just hours and hours of writing and writing and writing and uh, per day, um, and and just like books and books and books of it, like just not just journals and journals and journals uh -huh. of these narratives. And then um, I don't know why, I mm. don't know why it just. You know, but it's there, like in me. But it's just it's it just gestating, maybe. Yeah. I think so. In fact, um, and I do, I I do know that it if whatever. Okay, so I'm working on it right now. <laughs> it's like a confession. It's like hard for me to say it. I don't know why. I think I'm really identified as a poet, but mm -hmm. but I do know that. And an essayist, I I know I write essays. I know yeah. that, and I've and I've published a few. And it's not. But I feel like the, the thing of the novel is like the biggest, to me it's like the biggest, like the best candy in the store. And I'm just like, <laughs> it's too much for me. Like, no, um, poetry is like my spiritual space. Yeah. Um, and I feel that uh, writing novels is like a, would be like a dream come true, like a, like a, mm -hmm. like a luxury, like a, like a thing that I, I don't know, I have to like allow myself that yeah. space, that's that freedom. So I don't know. I, I think that that's, it's like a per, like a process. I gotcha. think it's, yeah. Well, I think it's interesting because the, the, the poems in the two collections too, I would say are more narrative, no, sorry, uh, more lyric poems than narrative poems as well too. Um, so maybe that's sort of a, a sideways entrance into the material through metaphor. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh no, I can't imagine all, like, not include like anything I write will have will always have um, poetry. Like there's yeah. no way I can I can let go of this like yeah. voice. So, hmm. but um, it's very much a poetry of witness as well too. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, do do you feel an obligation, or do you feel that art has that obligation? I mean, your own unique experience, but even larger than that. I mean, I I think that we are always in a state of witnessing and mm -hmm. and testifying whether we want to admit it or not, whether, mm -hmm. you know, however we construct truth, um, it, the, like our truth is, is an act of witness and testifying. I think that we call it that is, is interesting to know, like who, whose poetry is considered like witness and testimony and whose is not, um, because I feel like I, I see a lot of witnessing in poems that may not necessarily be labeled like poetry of witness. Mm -hmm. I think when we're talking about like political poetry, what is political, like what, it, it, I don't see this necessarily as political, I know it's political. Mm -hmm. I know that how it's perceived, I'm not, I'm not gonna lie, like I make, I make sure that I am um, not holding back any part of my self in these poems, but but I think that that is true for almost all poets. And mm -hmm. so what is then political? Like my truth, is that somehow more politicized than some mm -hmm. other truth? Um, but I feel like the best poetry that kind of resonates with anyone will have that element of the witness and the testifying, like I saw this, I lived this. And and whether or not we choose to call that political is, is there's, there's a politic to that, isn't there? Yeah. Like, there's a there's a whole conversation there, um, but yeah, I do think like I, you know, I witnessed a lot of witnessed a lot of PTSD, a lot of psych, you know, psychiatric like um, 
ramifications of like genocide and mm -hmm. torture and capture and captivity and persecution. I've witnessed that. Mm -hmm. I witnessed like poverty and hunger and um, violence of all of all kinds. And, and, and that was just a reality, right? So if I'm yeah. gonna speak to my reality, this is it. But like, that doesn't mean that that this is particularly like poetry of protest or political poetry. It just functions that way in a society that chooses to like negate th mm -hmm. this existence. But but it, it I, I don't know. I feel like when I read other poem, poems, I'm like, there's I can sense like the poems that resonate with me from like other realities. I'm like yeah. that I can sense whether it's authentic and true. Like I sure. And to me, like that's their witness and that's their now. I think absence of, I think it's interesting when people don't see that they are political in their own writing, right? Mm -hmm. They don't recognize the politics of race and class that are present, and yet I recognize it, you mm -hmm. know, in their writing, but they may not see it. Like, I find that to be interesting. Um, and I think that goes into the question of, like, what kind of poetry do I write? I think that also is, like, there was a long, there was, like, a very long time where, I like, I would send my poetry out and the rejection letters would come back, like, it's a little bit too, like, political or mm -hmm. whatever. And now it's just, like, it, it's, it's, like, what, yeah. <laughs> the more the merrier. But, like, I feel like that's, it's interesting that what my reality hasn't really changed from 1970s yeah. on. Like, so, like, it's interesting to know how we define what is political, what is protest, when yeah. is the right time, when is it safe, when is it not safe, when is it urgent, when is it not urgent. I find it interesting because I feel like it's always urgent yeah. to have your truth, your reality validated and heard and shared and to mm -hmm. to not close yourself off to other people also right yeah. to not just stay in these little groups and bubbles and just to like really create a space for all this sure. co conversation so i don't know i'm just really excited to to share with brookdale tonight's <laughs> gonna be really amazing but you've also this has been translated into um spanish and um has been published in argentina right yeah so yeah. how was how did that feel to have this this book and these stories then being published from a home you had to flee going back to argentina is always really difficult for me mm. um because every time i've gone it's been for like a trial or for you know some kind of transaction some mm -hmm. kind of issue like it's never been for um like connection with you know with the land or reconciling or yeah. any kind of um coming home so um that uh, there was this group of prof um, professors that reached out to me and wanted to like work with my poems. That kind of validation was really powerful because I mm. feel like they reject, like in Argentina, there's been a deeper rejection of the work. Like it's 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 dangerous. Like mm. uh, my mother's work in particular, like has been um, just only recently been acknowledged. You know, uh, I mean, it was acknowledged around the world. And, and what I mean by my mother's work is that she wrote a collection of short um, stories, memoir of uh, her experiences in the concentration camps, mm -hmm. you know. And only like three years ago was this book published in Argentina. Mm -hmm. So like they, even though there's been activism for decades and a desire to hear, I felt like my, my, poems were not really that important as the as were the po I mean mm -hmm. I felt like the poems that were being written in Argentina were were much more important for Argentinians to read and so I was really flattered and honored and um kind of felt like embraced when these these That's professors wonderful. reached out to me and were like we'd like to study like the impact of exile and this exilic voice and the That's great. Yeah. Um, and the book does that beautifully. So it's been such a pleasure speaking oh, with you. Thank and, you. Um, it's so good to yeah, be here. Excited for your reading tonight. Yay, thank you. And if you'd like to know more about our creative writing classes, which are open to the community, or more about the Visiting Writer series, please check out our website.